Tears, Idle Tears by Alfred Tennyson was published in 1847 in a volume of poetry titled The Princess. This melancholy poem examines life from a perspective of life's end with memories affecting the speaker in some indefinable way. Contrary to the common notion that equates death with sadness, Tennyson balances the sad part of the poem with sweetness, freshness and love. Distant memories seem so real to the speaker that the past has a life of its own and the poem suggests that this is the source of sadness that we get from days that are no more. Let's see the summary of the poem. The poem begins by referring to tears that are idle, not in the physical sense of motionlessness that we usually use the word for, but in the broader sense. Idle here means useless or creating nothing or causing nothing to happen. This is what gives the poem the tragic mood. The speaker feels tears and is very observant and clear in describing them. But there is nothing to be done about them. The speaker says that, though their meaning is unknown, the tears originate from a divine despair and travel through the heart into the eyes. The last two lines of this stanza describe the circumstances under which these tears rise. There is a contradiction in line 4, that helps support the idea of idleness in the tears. The reference to autumn fields is clear enough. As autumn is a time when plants die and animals begin to migrate or hibernate and this by itself would be appropriate for a discussion of despair and tears. But Tennyson adds the word happy which cancels out that gloomy effect. Throughout this poem, Tennyson balances images of hope against images of depression. And so line 5's reference to the days that are no more is not so obviously a negative reference as it may seem upon first reading. If the author had meant to portray these memories as being awful to the poem's speaker, he could have strengthened the sense of hopelessness by using the description days past or days gone by, which would emphasize the fact that they are lost instead of their simple lack of existence. In the second stanza, the beam referred to in line 6 is a sunbeam, the first one of the sunrise, an image of newness, and beginning that has the opposite implication as the autumn field mentioned in line 4. That this dawn sunbeam is hitting a ship's sail offers a sense of newness, especially when we find out in the next line that the ship is bringing friends. But then in line 7, the poem shows its contradictory nature, again by saying that these friends are arriving from the underworld. Literally, this reference would have referred to the southern hemisphere, notated on Victorian era maps with upside down type as the bottom of the globe. However, there is no way to deny that going back to Greek mythology and beyond, the underworld has referred to the realm of the dead. The only way these friends could return from the underworld would be through memory. But the poet infuses these memories with life by connecting them to freshness and daybreak. Line 8 follows the mention of the underworld with sadness, reversing the sunrise imagery with the last beam of sunset that reddens the sky and then sinks, like the same ship departing below the horizon. While the underworld reference in line 7 brought up the idea of memories of loved ones, line 9 implies that the speaker is actually facing death. With no future, the speaker talks of exploring the present and the past equally as the same sort of sensations using fresh 
and sad to describe both everyday occurrences of sun's motion and also the days that are no more. The third stanza expands upon the imagery of the previous stanza, but the relationship is brought out more clearly. Since the dawn has already been mentioned in line 6 and the speaker's approaching death is implied in line 9, this stanza takes the time to consider in detail what sadness the coming dawn would create in a dying person and in the end relates that sadness to memory. Line 11 repeats the contradiction of line 4's happy autumn fields with dark summer dawns since both summer and dawn are associated with brightness, not dark. The song or pipe of birds before sunrise so early that the birds themselves are only half awake is a sound that is seldom heard. But we can infer that dying ears are aware of this sound precisely because they are dying and are observing worldly experiences while they can. This is clearly the case with the dying eyes that focus on the window frame in the dark and stay on it until the sunrise slowly makes it glimmer or glow. There is a sense of desperation, of hunger, implied in the way the dying person seeks out even the slightest physical experience and in the last line of this stanza, the memories of the dying person are given equal importance with the current experiences. In the final stanza, the three ideas that tears, idle tears is concerned with, memory, death and, as implied by kisses, life, are brought together. The next three lines use the imagery of romantic love, which has not played a part earlier in the poem. Even hopeless love, symbolized by the imaginary kisses given to someone who belongs to another, and is thus unobtainable, is introduced in the poem as sweet. The poem goes on to demonstrate just how deeply the days that are no more extend into a dying person's existence by comparing those days to first love, which is presented as the deepest experience life has to offer. Tennyson attempts to convey how the loss of the past can evoke wild regret, even as love remembered can. Line 20, the last line, compares the days irretrievably lost to death in life, rendering the poem's images of idle tears and dying hours relevant to those who have not experienced either. The poem Tears, Idle Tears is written in blank verse, which means that there is no definite rhyme scheme. It consists of four synquains, that is, stanzas of five lines each. Each stanza develops its own idea for the first four lines and then at the end of the fifth line returns to the refrain of the days that are no more. Although there is no strict meter or rhyme scheme in the poem, it does not rely upon some devices that are related to rhyme to bind it together musically. While rhyme relies upon the repetition of the final vowel and consonant sounds as in where, fair or spill, thrill, Tennyson connects his ideas together with alliteration, the repetition of the first sound in a word. Tennyson also views this poem together with approximate rhymes which do not necessarily have their final consonant in common but share a similar vowel sound. Both alliteration and approximate rhymes give the reader a feeling of wholeness and completeness about the poem. Now let's see the important themes in the poem. The first and prominent theme in the poem is death. The speaker of this poem is mystified by the tears that he is shedding. In contemplating this mystery, the speaker explores the idea of death. In the first stanzas, death is only implied as the poem mentions the things that are gone forever. It is the finality of death that is implied here, its ability to shut a final door. 
since death is the ultimate irreversible experience. The speaker knows that his strange anguish stems from the one-way nature of life and he uses imagery that refers to death in the first two stanzas, autumn and the underworld. The references of death reach a new level in stanza 3 when the speaker mentions dying ears that hear the morning song of birds and dying eyes that watch the casement or window when it starts glowing with sun rays. The implication that someone is sick and bedridden might lead readers to believe that the poem is about a specific dying person, but it might also be a comment on the situations all human face, the inevitability of death. The speaker's awareness of this truth would account for the inexplicable divine despair that pervades the whole poem. By the final stanza, death is present. Rather than the vague notion it was before, it is presented as a concrete reason for the speaker's tears. In the end, death is used for emotional impact in common conversation. Death in life is an oxymoron, a self-contradiction unless the word death is understood as the worst type of misery. The second theme that we see in this poem is love. This poem views the two most significant motivating factors in life as death and love. And it turns to these two factors when trying to make sense of the speaker's sorrow, which has no specific cause. Death is more vivid by showing it beside its opposite, the beauty and liveliness of nature. Like death, Love is considered almost casually at first and grows to major significance only in the end. The first time the word is used, it is not a reference to romantic love, but an affirmation of life. All we love is brought up in line 9 to emphasize the thoroughness of death as represented by the setting sun. The last stanza of the poem gives great attention to the role romantic love plays. In order to examine love in its extreme, Tennyson specified that his subject is first love, the most pure and spontaneous kind. There are two types of love that he presents as possible causes of his sorrow. The first he represents a remembered kisses after death which indicate a love affair that lives on in a person's mind but can never be continued because the other lover is gone. The second image of love introduces a human into this poem that is mostly about human nature, for example, the untrue lover who kisses one person while actually loving another. This deceit earns special attention in the poem as the only thing one human can do to another that would cause this kind of deep sorrow to inspire these idle tears. Romantic treachery is treated here as the equal of death in its ability to bring out the joy out of the human soul. The third theme we can see in this poem is permanence. The impression Tennyson gives in this poem is that all sorrow seems from the fact that beautiful days and wild first love eventually end. He uses imagery, in particular sunrise and sunset, to indicate that life follows a progression from beginning to end. He also utilizes the idea of death to show that unlike days or seasons, Life is not a cycle. Each stanza ends with the reflection on the days that are no more, a phrase that is constructed to bring out the sadness and strangeness of what is lost. The poem does not reflect on the benefits of time's passage, how one outlives diseases and grows wiser, because it is an emotional examination of the mysterious, unexplained tears in no way pretending to give a balanced view. Tennyson's explanation of his mystery leads him to a central problem of human existence, 
the fact people cannot hold on to things they would like to freeze in time 